There is a lot of talk during this time of the pandemic about nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And I remember my one visit to the memory care unit of a assisted living facility. And you never know in a memory care unit where people have Alzheimer's or dementia, whether they remember you from one visit to the next. And so as often would be the case, I would approach each person and I would ask them if they knew who I was so that I could remind them and nudge their memory. And so I went up to this lady and I said to her, I said, do you know who I am? I said to her, do you know who I am? And she looks at me and she says, no. But if you ask at the front desk, they can tell you. <laughs> this question of do we know who we are is one that we should all ask ourselves on this All Saints Day celebration because the second reading from the first letter of St. John tells us that each of us, first and foremost, is a child of God. Beloved, see what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called the children of God, and so we are. That is an identity that each of us has been given that no one can take away from us. No politician can take that identity away from us. No sin can take that identity from us. No mistake that we could have committed or can commit in this life can rob us of the identity that has been bestowed on us to be called children of God. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed because we await the revelation of the fullness of our identity in heaven where I hope to go. I don't know about each of you. I think some of you may be just hoping to go to purgatory, but I am hoping to go to heaven. And I would invite each and every one of you to hope for the very same thing because... That is what we should be about as Christians, to be saints and great saints and not to miss our opportunity. For a long time, the church used to only canonize, that is, make a saint, a formal saint, out of bishops, priests, and nuns. But in today's day and age, we see, especially with the advent of the great Saint John Paul II, the Pope from no other country than from Poland. Of course, you, you know that only good things come from Poland. He canonized more saints than all the popes combined, and he canonized regular people. And Pope Francis has continued that with the recent canonization of the millennial saint, the 15-year-old young men, Carlo Acutis, who was a computer geek, a genius, and as a 15-year-old was canonized to show an example to young people that all of us can be saints because that's what we should be about in our life, to be a saint, that is, to go to heaven. And holiness is not something that is out of our, the realm of possibility for us. It is not out of reach. You and I can be holy. We can be great saints. Now the second reading says, We do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope, see that is the hope we live with. The Bible teaches us over and over again that we are not like the rest of the world because we walk with hope. And hope does not disappoint. We have peace in our hearts because we are filled with hope 
by being children of God. Everyone who has this hope based on him makes himself pure as he is pure. In other words, whatever it is that I have faced in my life, meaning all of us are marked with stuff in our life. You know, there are, uh, uh, there's dirt on us by virtue of being sinners, by the mistakes that you have made. And a lot of us, oftentimes, when you look at the mistakes that you have done in your life, you can feel like, me? How can I ever make it to heaven with all the things I've done? You know, I've cheated on my husband. I've cheated on my wife. I may have had an abortion. How can I make it to heaven, you say? You know, I, I, I stole. I was a terrible mother. I did all these horrible things. You know, I, I, I worked and worked and I, and I neglected my family. Me? Look at all the things that I've done in my past. How can I make it to heaven? Well, if you hope in God, you confess your sins, the hope, the second reading says, is what should make you pure. What makes you pure in the sight of God? Not that you are perfect, but the one who is perfect wants you to be perfect, as the Bible says. Be ye holy, be ye perfect, as the Lord your God is holy and perfect. So it's not that I haven't done anything in my past. It's that the one who wants me to be with him calls me to himself that gives me the hope that I will one day, through the mercy of God, be with him forever in the halls of heaven. It's not just the call to Mother Teresa to be a saint, but to each of us. And you say, me? No, not me. With all my sins and all my shortcomings and all the mistakes that I've done or that I continue to do, I continue to sin. I will never get to be a saint because I'm such a terrible person. That type of attitude is of the devil who brings you down. The devil in uh, Hebrew, Satan, Hasatan, you notice that? S Satan there means the great accuser. He's the one that tells you you're good for nothing, you're, you're ugly, you, you know, you're, you're a terrible person. He brings you down. He makes you depressed. He makes you anxious. He makes you worried. And he fills you with fear. God picks you up. And you say to yourself, it just seems impossible to change and be good. Look at me. You say to yourself, I will never make it. And then you read the first reading today, which is a very famous reading, because it's made famous by the Jehovah Witnesses who say that only 144,000 people will be saved. And I think to myself, you know, if there's more than 7 billion people in the world and they say that only 144,000 will make it to heaven, then why are they out trying to get more people? That's more competition. I mean... <laughs> why, why would you want to... Why would you want more competition if only 144,000 people are going to make it to heaven? I mean, come on, okay? Let's be real, okay? The first reading where we hear that 144,000 people will be saved is not meant to be taken literally. That's so little compared to the 7 billion people who are in the world today. This is all, of course, very symbolic because 144 is what? 12 times 12. And thousands is a biblical way to say a lot. When the Bible says a thousand, it just means a lot. Okay? The Bible exaggerates because in Hebrew, there is no way that... Uh, Hebrew is a very sim uh, simple language at the, in terms of the way that they say things. So... Uh, uh, like much, 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 a lot would be they would exaggerate to say it. So 12 times 12 is 144. 
And this is a Hebrew way of lifting the conversation to the next level, to say so very much, to say gigantic, gigantically, in other words, a lot. 12 in Hebrew means wholeness. It's a way of saying everybody. That's why there were the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, because it's just a way of saying uh, uh, that God invites every single person, that no one is excluded from the plan of salvation prepared by our God. It's a symbolic way to say all are included, that this invitation is for everybody. God invites 12 times 12, 144, but then it goes to the next level and says 1,000. 144,000. See, God wants everybody. So this is not just for special people, but it's for me. It's for you. It's not just for Mother Teresa. God chose everyone to be a saint. Now, for years, the church, as I've told you before, would only canonize special people. But that's not the case today. To be a saint, all you have to be willing to do is try. In other words, every day, not think that I need to be perfect now and have it all figured out and that I won't fall. No, you will continue to fall. You know why? Because the only way to pick yourself up is to fall. And if you never fall, you can never pick yourself up. So you will fall, but the walk of holiness is not about falling. It's about getting up. As long as you get back up, that's why heaven is full of people. That's what the first reading is trying to say. Ordinary people like you and me, not just some special kind of people. That's why the vision John has tells us today. After this, I had a vision of a great multitude. Now you understand this, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation. Race, people, and tongue. It's kind of like Queen of Peace Church. You know, we have a mixture of every single person. That's why it's so great to be in a Catholic church, you know. Because we look around and we see people like the book of Revelation. Every nation, race, people, and tongue. Isn't that great? <clears throat> Wonderful. Lots of people from all places. Heaven is full of every kind of person. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb, wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. Then one of the elders spoke up and said to me, Who are these wearing white robes, and where did they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you are the one who knows. He said to me, These are the ones who have survived the time of great distress. What does it say here? Distress suffering, problems. Now you understand you've had a life of distress. You've had issues in your life. You've had things happen to you. You've done things. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, the folks came into heaven dirty with filthy robes. What does this mean? They had stains on them, and in heaven the Lamb washed them clean. Jesus washed them there. You understand that? It's not that perfect people make it there. Okay, that's why our teaching of purgatory is so very important. Purgatory is like a step on the way to heaven. We get cleaned. It's, it, see, our church is like... It's, a, it's such an inclusive church, despite of what you hear, you know, from all the, the people around, you know, who say that, oh, you know, the Catholics, you know, with the rules and regulations and, 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 you know, all of that. Okay, we're such an inclusive faith. We want everybody to be saved, every single person. We're such a church full of hope, you know, and we're a church of second and third and fourth chances. The teaching of the church on purgatory is such a wonderful teaching. That means that God wants everybody to make it to heaven. You know, it's, it's, it's so wonderful. 
that, you know, God, even after you pass from this life, doesn't want anyone to be lost, but wants everybody to be there with him. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places, and I go before you to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you also may be. That's what Jesus said. I don't want anybody to be lost. I want every single person to be with me. So even after we pass from this world, we have a chance to be washed clean. How great is the love of God for each and every one of us. And that should fill you with hope because all of you have had family members who may not have had the most exemplary life, who may have done terrible things. And you may be filled with thoughts in your mind, oh, did they make it to heaven? What's wrong with you? Don't you believe in the mercy of God? That God above all is mercy and love? And that God wants everyone to make it there? So what does God want from you? God wants you to try. What did the saints do when they got to heaven? The Bible says in the first reading, they prostrated themselves before the throne, worshiped God and exclaimed, Amen, blessings and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's the key to holiness. It's someone who walks humbly, knowing that he doesn't have it all figured out, but that it all comes from God and is so open to God and God's power that God, seeing this openness and humility, gives it to him. It's God who will do it, not me. It's grace. So stop thinking that this will all happen by your own strength. It won't. How did they get to heaven? because they got it that they needed to let God act in their lives. And because they allowed God to act, it happened in their lives. So let God be God. They let themselves be washed by the Lamb. They were as dirty as we all are. But God washed them, and God continues to wash us. So allow yourself to be washed. And on a personal level, this comes uh, very true for me during this time, particularly when for the first time in 10 years of being a priest, I have had the great privilege to confirm young people during this time of the pandemic. The bishop has given permission in our diocese for each pastor to confirm, to confer the sacrament of confirmation. And, you know, I used to always be so down, you know, when I see the young people who are in preparation for the sacraments. And we, we would, in many of the parishes I was at, we would grill them and drill into them for a couple of years, all the rules and regulations and the catechism of the church. And then they would not come after they got the sacrament. And I was so down, you know, on myself. Gosh, you know, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? And it's also the same thing with uh, people who just come and uh, uh, to have their baby baptized or, or seek other sacraments and, and may not be as practicing. And, you know, in, in, in certain parishes, and I won't mention where I've been at, they make all of these requirements to get uh, the sacraments. In one of the parishes I was at, I won't mention because um, I'm being recorded. I won't mention where I was at, okay? Uh, in order to baptize your baby, you have to, you'd have to register in the parish and go every single Sunday for six months and make sure you dropped your envelope into the basket and the pastor would check that you were there and of course something had to be in the envelope of course you know <laughs> for six months okay or you know the godparents needed to have all their check marks uh you know requirements all checked 
and every, um, or now they're, they're looking at uh, in certain places that in order to be married in the church, to have the sacrament of holy matrimony, you have to go through at least a year of preparation. I mean, all of these requirements. And then, you know, the, so, so people are just like, give up. And I think to myself, you know, maybe this is like okay to do. Or, and, and then God spoke to me. Because I, I've had all of these things in me, you know, about that I'm, I'm confirming all of these people. I'm baptizing all of these babies. And I, I baptize all of these people. And, and what happens, you know? And then I'm doing the, I'm conferring the sacrament of confirmation. And I'm laying the hands on the, laying my hands, calling the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, I closed my eyes and I feel like something coming out of me, like some sort of a force that just was leaving me. And I could feel that it was being, as I laid my hands on the, on the heads of the young people being confirmed, that that force, that strength that was leaving me, and it was so strong, and those who were there can testify to that, that I mean, I almost fell over. It's, like unreal, that it was leaving me and going right into the young people being confirmed. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's God who sanctifies. It's God who converts. It's God who makes us holy. It's all about God in our life. And God is love. And God loves each and every one of us so very much. So this is a day for us to be lifted up in our life. A, a day full of hope for us. You know, for each and every one of us. And I think the best example of that is I particularly think of my own grandfather in Poland. Who my grandmother for 44 years prayed that he would be converted. He was a member of the Communist Party and he professed atheism. He never went to church, ever. And he would make fun of us when we would go to church. And everything changed in one week in his life when he was diagnosed with colon cancer on a Tuesday. And the following Sunday, I enter the kitchen and he's all dressed up and I say to him, why are you all dressed up? And he says, I'm going to church with you today. And at that, my grandmother entered, grabbed me by whatever I was wearing and pulled me out and said, shh, let's just go along with it. <laughs> and eight months later, he died of the colon cancer that he was diagnosed with. My grandmother prayed for him for 44 years, quietly, trusting in that same power of the Holy Spirit that left me as I was giving the sacrament of confirmation. Trusting in that power. And God did not disappoint her. My grandfather made a confession at the end of his life. And he died in peace, something that no communist ideology or Marxist manifesto could give him, that Jesus Christ gave him. He died in peace at the end of his life. It was the fruit of the prayers of my grandmother for 44 years of hoping and trusting in God. But you know what else? My grandfather was baptized. He was baptized. His parents baptized him. And then, you know, because he, he was born before the Second World War, and then the Nazis came in, and then the communists, and you know this thing, okay? But he was given the gift. So he had it. He had the power in him. So do not despair in your own life. So many of you have children who have stopped going to church, right? And you're all worried. You're like, you know, what's going to happen to them? Stop it. 
Just trust in God. Pray for them. And stop worrying about your loved ones who have passed on. Leave them to the hands of God. Look at how hopeful the readings are today. How wonderful. It's all about our attitude. Look at the, you know, the gospel today is the be attitudes. Be attitudes. The attitude of how to be, how to live. So what's your attitude in life, in other words? That's how we are to live, with the attitude of faith, the attitude of hope in our life. And that's what I'm inviting each and every one of you to do today in your life. And that's the attitude with which I walk in my own very life, especially on a day like today. I was walking in the church today, and I was particularly reminded of that because my grandfather was always fascinated by the penny, the one-cent coin that we have in the... the one-cent that we have in the United States. And let me tell you that I was reminded of that right now. I was reminded of that because as I'm walking into church today, I found a penny. Mm -hmm. There is not one day that passes that I do not find a penny somewhere. Now, for those of you who are cynics and, you know, like, oh, well, there's pennies everywhere. You know, it's all a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. It's my faith that tells me that penny reminds me that my grandfather is okay, that he's in heaven, that he is my own personal saint, and that he's praying for me, that he's proud of me, and that he is waiting for me. When the love of God when the love of God, which destroyed death, brings us back together in that one place which no eye has seen and no ear has heard about what God has ready for those who love him. Amen.